this story is about the downfall of a man they call Big Ike. Ike wasn't the regular hustler. In the early 1980s, his operation was one of the biggest in Miami-Dade County. See, Ike was one of those guys that had a direct connect with the Colombians. He used his construction business to build 30 houses in two-story apartment buildings that he used as his own personal distribution network. In his time, he laid the foundation for the other street legends that came after him. This is the story of Isaac Hicks, known in the streets as Big Ike. No, no, he's not permitted to use any of his properties as collateral for bond. So far, no bond has been set for Hicks, whose empire is expansive. 32 properties valued at nearly $3 million will eventually be confiscated, including three duplexes, five vacant lots, four apartment buildings, two vacant office buildings, one building under construction, eight unoccupied homes, and nine occupied homes. In the early 1980s, the Colombians like Pablo Escobar and Griselda Blanco was focused on one thing, and that was satisfying America's appetite for that stuff. See, the big dogs in Colombia created a network of pilots and boat captains that focused on getting packages into Miami by any means necessary. But just like the music business, even if you have good product, you need distribution. And that's where Ike would play his part. This story begins when Ike was already in the game for 15 years. But unlike the other crews that came after him, Ike wasn't about that violence. He was about that money. Most of the time, you would catch him head to toe in some dickies like the regular working man. Instead of fancy cars, he put money into a construction business. That business was the International Building and Construction Corporation. Ike bought land and then he used his construction company to build houses and two-story apartment buildings all over Miami. He would put his people in position and use the buildings collectively as a network to distribute his product. This was no small operation as Ike owned and controlled 30 different properties. This situation lasted for a long while and made Ike millions of dollars. In 1979, broad daylight, Colombian hitmen walked into a liquor store and made two other men victims of the war. But occurred at about 2.30 when two Latin males entered the Crown Liquor Store at the west end of the Dadeland Mall. While the clerk was making up their order, two more Latin men entered the store and began firing. Police say they don't know what the motive was for the sh but they are sure it wasn't robbery. Again, they have not said that it, it was related, but that is certainly a possibility. This was just one of many violent events that was fueled by the trade that was going on in Miami. It was like an epidemic that started underground, but eventually spread through the streets and affected the lives of every citizen with a regular 9-to-5 job. The next year, the city lost more than 500 people because of the trade. The year after that, the city lost more than 600. It was out of hand to the point where the morgue was overloaded and the medical examiner's office had to rent refrigerated trucks to keep up with the aftermath of such violence. With the help of the Colombian traffickers like Rafael Salazar and Griselda, by 1982 Miami was responsible for more than 70% of the trafficking of the whole United States. And for that, it became known as the trafficking capital of the world. From New York to Miami, things got worse when the epidemic hit the town. And along with that, the Jamaican shower posse wanted a piece of the action. This kept federal and local law enforcement busy 365 days a year. So they began fighting back the only way they knew how, by shutting down the men and women involved. And in 1985, it was Ike's turn. An investigation started with a group of detectives who were known for taking down drug organizations that have been plaguing Miami for the past few years. They started doing surveillance on a few of his properties, watching people and cars coming and going, writing down license plates to identify what addresses those plates were registered to. One day they tracked 200 cars arriving and then leaving 15 minutes later. It was obvious. The next step was to get people on the inside of Ike's organization to cooperate, and that's exactly what they did. Ike didn't do business with just anybody, he had his inner circle of people he trusted. So detectives recruited family members and friends of the people that belonged to that inner circle. People like Deborah, Donald, and Alice. They weren't snitches, they were confidential informants that were paid to do a job. And that job was to buy product, over and over again, and also to report which one of Ike's properties were being used to store that product. In 86, the operation continued. 
The informants continued to buy product, not directly from Mike, but from his people. And the informants made sure the transactions were done in the buildings owned by Ike. The full court press started when law enforcement conducted search warrants on those properties. And in January, they ran up in one of his spots and found weapons, paperwork with names and receipts. The next month, the same thing. The month after that, the same thing. They took work, weapons, ledgers, and crucial information that identified the inner workings of the operations. Names, dates, and locations. The part that confused Ike is that they didn't arrest anybody. So the organization thought it was just a group of crooked cops, just filling their pockets with whatever they found. But that wasn't it. This was just part of a master plan. From January of 86 to halfway through the year, the informants just kept buying product from Ike's organization. Each sale was documented. That same year, a man named Sam, who was one of the men belonging to Ike's inner circle, had a cousin named Alice. Alice was in the game, and she made multiple sales directly from Sam. She was a family member, so while Sam was picking up and making deliveries, sometimes Alice would be with him, chilling in the passenger seat. After a while, she got to know way too much. She knew where they kept the product, the money, the locations of all the active stash houses, where her cousin Sam would pick up and make deliveries. In the beginning of 87, Alice took it to the next level. She went to Ike's house and tried to get some work directly from him. Ike told her she needs to speak to Sam, but a few days later, Ike got the word that she might be an informant, and he told Sam. That same year, law enforcement was able to get help from a woman named Deborah. See, Deborah knew Ike, but she was also an informant, so she set him up, and in March, she got some work from Ike. The next month, she did it again. Both times, the transactions was recorded by law enforcement. Deborah then found out that Ike was about to receive a shipment of 30 bundles, and she reported it to her handlers. They set up surveillance teams at different locations and waited for Ike to make a move. Ten days later, on April 24th, Deborah was at Ike's house with Ike and a few of his right-hand men. Once she confirmed it was going down, she left and went to a payphone and called her handlers and reported that she saw the money and the deal was about to go down. After Ike and his team made the move and got back to the house, they unloaded some of the cars. A few days later, she contacted her handlers and told them that the team dropped off the work at multiple locations. With this information, law enforcement had what they needed to get a judge to sign off on what was about to happen next. Keep in mind that Ike's house was under surveillance for weeks now, and everything that Deborah said was going to happen was simultaneously being witnessed and recorded by detectives. When Ike left his house, detectives followed him. He saw them in his rearview mirror and stepped on the gas, and it was on. After a brief chase, they caught up to him and arrested him. And just like Deborah told them, they found weapons, receipts, packing materials, documents, and to help seal the deal, 45 pounds of that stuff, fresh off the boat that arrived from Colombia. In addition to documents, they found what would be equivalent in today's economy, 89,000 in cash and 900 in gold and diamond jewelry. On April 27, 1987, Ike, his wife Janet, and his right-hand man James were arrested. Isaac Hicks' guard dog and his wife Janet herself, just recently released on $100,000 bond, had to greet U.S. Marshals first thing this morning. Using videotape cameras to inventory, it was Hicks' $168,000 heavily guarded home, nicknamed the Palace, that was confiscated first. Two months later, they started seizing his properties. Eight months after his arrest, Ike, his wife, and members of his inner circle were convicted. When the other hustlers found out that Ike was off the streets, other crews went to war and fought for control over his territory. And that was the foundation for the violence between Vonda's gang, Booby Boys, John Doe's, and other crews of the late 80s and early 1990s. James Bossman Sawyer, the guy in the passenger seat when Ike took the detectives on a high-speed chase, was sentenced to decades behind bars. Janet, his wife, was sentenced to 20 years. And for conducting a criminal enterprise, Isaac Hicks was sentenced to 137 years in prison. In 1988, just a few months after she was sentenced, Janet was hospitalized. 
and after four months in the federal prison hospital, she passed away from medical complications on September 11, 1988. She was 33 years old. As for Ike, in 1993, all his properties went up for auction, and a few months after that, he would be hospitalized before passing away, five years after his wife, in November 1993, due to complications of contracting the virus, and then having fully blown AIDS. He was 57 years old. This is the story of Isaac Hicks, known in the streets as Big Ike.